Join us and our guest Natalie Morris Sharma as we conclude our podcast series on the art of negotiation with an inside look at diplomacy. In this final episode, we'll peel back the layers of intergovernmental negotiations to see what makes this process complex and unique. Well, welcome everybody back to another episode of Maxwell Podcast. Um, Maxwell on route, which uh, basically today we're carrying on with season two about negotiation, and we're so pleased to have with us today Miss Natalie uh, Morris Sharma, um, which she is the senior director, uh, senior state counsel with the International Affairs Division of the Attorney General's Chambers. Uh, so glad to have you back here, Natalie. And um, the thing that that I think uh, for me was the first time that I really heard about your name was uh, about your work with the Singapore Convention uh, and how you were the chairperson of Uncentral Working Group 2 and, and extremely uh, skilled in bringing together uh, everything that led to the convention being um, basically um, signed. Uh, and so so welcome, Natalie. Uh, thanks thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, so so I, I actually uh, was was talking to you about this earlier and you mentioned that you actually had a very early experience uh, with negotiation you know, in your university days. Tell us more about that. Yes, so um, I used to be a bit of a youth activist um, and I would go for youth conferences and advocate on such issues. Um, and one of my early uh, experiences and outings in that capacity was at the World Youth Congress in Casablanca in Morocco, where we Ooh, developed nice. a, the Casablanca Declaration about how youths could help to implement the UN Millennium Development Goals, as they then were. So it's prior to the Sustainable right, Development right. Goals. Um, and as the c Congress developed, there were a thousand of us delegates, a small group maybe, Eight to ten of us were asked to sit down and draft that declaration from scratch, mm. which we did. Mm -hmm. And then I was asked to chair the Congress meeting to adopt that declaration. Wow. Um, and, but it was really a trial by fire because um, we had very sensitive issues that remain sensitive to this day. Mm -hmm. I would not have known at the time. I didn't have that kind of sensitivity that you develop um, after being on the circuit for a while. Right. And... We had um, it was it would not be an exaggeration to say that it was an explosive <laughs> Congress session involving walkouts and very emotive interventions from delegations. We managed the declaration in the end, but it was highly dramatic. I think at the end of it, I had to go and stand in a corner and give a little cry when it was done because it was just so demanding oh, wow. emotionally. Um, but it was a it was exactly a, a trial by fire. Um, and where did the people? But and thrilled me still. I love. I actually loved the opportunity to be part of something right, um, right. like that. No, but where did the people come from in the Congress? All over. Uh, so it was an international. All university Congress. students. Uh, or most, yeah, I think everybody was in that, that tertiary level. Okay. Uh, and perhaps some were more familiar with such congresses, and others right. were not. But we were we were youths first, talking about issues that were of importance to ourselves Amazing. at the time. Um, and so, as you can imagine, especially as young people, um, <laughs> holding things to heart right. and being very passionate, right. um, it meant something. And that's why it, it triggered the kind of responses that we saw. And I, I learned the power of language, how a comma mm. was important, a word was important. I learned right. the power of process. Just because the first line is the first thing in the document doesn't mean you have to open with it. That happened to be the most right. explosive issue. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So, so little little tip, tips and tricks that I wish somebody had taught me before, um, I, I kind of had to pick up along I the way. See. But had the opportunity of doing so early. Well, which means that by the time you got to Uncertral Working Group, that's like easy peasy. You, you were well, no. highly <laughs> experienced by then, yeah. you know. But, but that's interesting because... Um, what is really, I mean, did you find that there was some difference um, in dealing with negotiation at, at such a large, like a Congress level, a multilateral level, compared to, say, when you're negotiating on an individual level with just one other party, say, in a commercial dispute or something like that? What, what kind of differences do you find in 
So the, it's so at some level there's similarities because you're still dealing with interests and positions. Mm-hmm. You're still dealing with cultural differences, especially in an international commercial context, as opposed and compared to an international negotiation context. Um, so there are, and you're still dealing with people. Mm. So the similarities are there. Okay. Uh, I think what sets it apart is um, in an international negotiation, in a multilateral negotiation, it's situated in an organizational setting. And oftentimes that brings with it practices and procedures, how things are done, rules mm. of the game. It's mm. not law of the jungle. Um, there are long-standing precedents and ways things uh, ways things are approached in an acceptable fashion mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that you that you generally should be aware of before you begin. Like protocols and you know, yeah, pro- protocols, procedures. procedures that can be very helpful, but can also stand in your way if you're right. on the other side. Um, so, so, that, so there's a large element of similarity, but also some differences. And I think that the other thing that I'd highlight, you said easy peasy, I've never found a negotiation <laughs> easy. <laughs> it, there's so many factors that change. Um, it's like a witch's brew. You shift one ingredient ever so slightly, and it's an entirely different forum, foray, mm-hmm. and exercise. Um, you change one person in the room, mm-hmm. and that can change an entire negotiation. Uh, so it's always been, for me, what keeps it exciting is it's always a learning curve. Right. There's always something new. You never know what to, you can expect most of it, but you never really fully know what to expect. Okay, so but what about governments, which is the level that you have been working at in your career? Like, how would that differ from, say, dealing with commercial parties? Let's say I'm dealing with businessmen, I'm dealing with in house counsel, uh, or even university students, right? Compared to, say, government officials, this person represents a very powerful nation, um, very entrenched interests, uh, and maybe even in the midst of a conflict with another country. I mean, do you find any difference in the negotiating approach in that kind of circumstance? Yes. So increasingly, companies, corporations and governments are becoming very similar, especially when you talk about large multinational corporations, because politics is relevant, bureaucracy is relevant, recognizing how much authority the person in front of you has Mm -hmm. to negotiate a particular position, language, and interest with you. Um, I I think that those people would find are similar, uh, but the degrees are probably where it differs. Uh, You're closer to politics when you deal with intergovernmental negotiations. Um, The publicity element is very, very important. Uh, There there are things where, uh, there are elements where a country cannot keep private because of maybe it's domestic laws Mm -hmm. or because it's the nature of the negotiation. It has to be open in order to be legitimate. Uh, Whereas maybe a cooperation might have a little bit more leeway there. And Ah. these are the types of uh, factors that I think can play into a negotiation very much because you have an open forum right, where you negotiate right. and then that, that's where your corridor conversations in a multilateral setting become a lot more important. The number of cultures you deal with are also scaled mm. in a multilateral negotiation. 150 to 200 people and countries right. often means an equivalent number of cultures as opposed to a corporation where at least there's some kind of corporate culture that would pull pull things in line and give sure, you a sense of, sure. of who and what you're dealing with. Um, so the dynamism and the the uh, level of, of, of differentiation that you see in a room, that's that's really, really interesting. So, so do you get situations like, I mean, I, I'm assuming it does happen, um, but have you personally encountered it where um, there's a public line from government officials, which first of all, it is to play to a domestic audience and also to continue to maintain um, a particular image they want of themselves in the public space. But privately, they tell you something opposite. They say, well, actually, we'd rather do this, but we can't say it. And can we find a face-saving way out of this or something like that? I mean, you get that. Yes, frequently. Um, it is not uncommon at all. And uh, so what, what, for instance, what you'd have happen is uh, particularly in either in a, ne- in a fellow negotiator setting, um, they would say, look, I can't open with this position, okay. but uh, I can finish with it. So I'll say this. Right. Maybe you then can come in and stay right. in position. So right. it must look like I put up a fight. A little but, bit. And then we gave each other a little bit and we came to something in the middle. Yes. It kind of looked like I gave away the house right at the start. Exactly. Or they'll say, I can't say it, but if you're the chairperson and if you make that call, 
I won't object right. because there are other values that are important to me, okay. including maintaining consensus in the room. Right, right. Um, I, I think that that draws out quite an interesting element about negotiation in mm -hmm. the multilateral space. A lot of people think that you are coming in to see who can walk away with the largest slice of the pie, mm -hmm. but that's not it at all. Um, a lot of multilateral negotiation, the way I like to conceive of it, is navigating a way forward together. Mm -hmm. So. Everybody works together to find how you can tag or find that path forward that allows you to reach the outcome of a particular document or language that you can all can that right. everybody can agree. But is it that, is that just your viewpoint, or do you find that that other negotiators from other countries, regardless of which country they represent, they all kind of have a similar mindset and and I mean they of course they represent different interests and they come from different cultural lenses, um, but their ultimate goal is similar to yours, to try to find a good way that everyone can agree on. Do you find that the case? Um, not all the time. So some some countries, some delegations, some representatives will come into a room, and their goal will to have not to not have their goal will be to not have an outcome. Right. Uh, so for for Singapore and for myself uh, representing Singapore, usually we are a constructive, neutral, and objective delegation. Mm. We're working towards producing the you know, the, the ultimate product that the meeting was called to deliver. Mm. Uh, and we will work towards that and, and and make contributions in that direction. But there will be some, there can be some delegations in the room that will say, actually, my objective in this meeting is to ensure you don't get there. <laughs> okay. But, but of course, so, so that brings to mind as well, the idea that some people have been given orders from, from above that they have to basically do a certain thing. Um, but then there's that dynamic of the actual person in the room. How important is that, that trust between the actual negotiators on a personal level, um, you know, quite apart from whatever instructions they have gotten back home? Because I, my, my uh, assumption is that, that you as a representative of the Singapore government um, have your instructions and have to go back if anything changes, but you also have some latitude on the ground to make certain decisions I'm guessing, um, and the way you also report back to Singapore, you know how things went. Again, that comes through your own perception of of whether it's you know we're close to it or or it's an impasse, it's very difficult, and so on. Um, so, would that mean that the negotiators themselves have a certain amount of of ability to to influence the outcome slightly, and therefore the relationship between them is also critical? I mean, what are your thoughts on this? By and large, I would say what you have described is fully accurate. Mm -hmm. um, we have the the person in the room is in my view, pivotal. Okay. You can have a brief from your home government that sent you to the meeting, but how you carry out that brief, it differs from person to person. Right. And it affects things like how smooth running a negotiation can be or how abrasive the negotiation right, can be. Right. A choice that, that will come down to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the element of trust, as you say, if you, can ha if you have a standing relationship with the party in, in, the, in, the, in the shoes of the other delegate, um, you could, for example, say, look, uh, we've had a long-standing relationship. You know that we're consistently of this particular view. You right. know we keep our word. Right, right. If you perhaps go down a little bit easier on this front, later where we have some wriggle room, we could also go down a little bit easier. And there's a bit of that quid pro quo. Right. But because there is a time lapse, if you don't have that trust, a deal like that cannot always be struck. Sure. People have to have enough trust in each other to be sure. able to say, okay, I'll give first, sure. and then you give later. Right. Uh, and then together we will be able to reach that consensus because we've all given and taken a little bit right, on the different right. issues. No, but that, that also brings up a very interesting dynamic that um, is different, in my opinion, between you know, state-level negotiations and commercial negotiations. Um, to some extent, if I'm negotiating with you as a commercial party, I can't really offer something in the future because there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to work together or we'll have another deal down the line beyond this one. But countries are here to stay, right? So, so you know, if you're difficult with me today, we're going to still see each other in a year's time at the UNGA or something else. Um, there, I, in a way, you could promise cooperation 
in the future in exchange for cooperation now because uh, states will always have to deal with each other for the foreseeable future. Do you find that's an interesting dynamic that's different? It is, it is. Um, I would say that you could actually draw the timeline differently. So mm -hmm. sometimes your give and take can happen in the context of one document. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can take place across different fora. Right. Um, and sometimes it can take place across years. But usually you try and keep you try and keep it within the same session or season. Okay. Also because um, and I think this is probably where uh, you could draw a bit more of a distinction. Uh, governments change. Change, right. Yeah, elections and, elections, and all. Elections, yeah. yeah. And that also plays into negotiation dynamics. You will, um, certain uh, countries will tell you, I can't take a decision on this type of issue right now. Okay. Uh, so if you want to call this to a close, this is the kind of thing I would have to say. Okay. But if you can hold it over for three months, I will be able to clear a position because we would have had our election. Right. Or I have to do it now because our elections are coming. Right, uh, right. So, so that also can impact the flow of issues and how deals are reached in a multilateral and intergovernmental context. Have you seen that personally where, where some other party, I mean, Singapore's context may not be really relevant um, given our political situation. But in some countries, have you had people tell you, um, we need to rush this because we're, we're not sure that the next government will be supportive of it. Did you hear that? Yes. Um, perhaps a little bit difficult for me to name uh, oh, no, the country course, specifically. Of course, of course. Uh, but definitely. Uh, I've seen it, heard it, uh, okay. not just once, across different forums as well and different types of issues. So some people think, oh, it's usually national security issues. No, it can be trade-related rela right. issues. It can be oceans issues. Um, to a certain extent, the mediation convention also, there were elements of what was our agenda? Can we get it passed if it's a treaty or not? Um, yeah, so that, that does play into the international circuit. Well, speaking of the of the Singapore Convention, uh, so, so uh, again, people keep referring to your skill in trying to push through uh, some very, very um, difficult ideas that people were quite far apart on in the process of coming up the Singapore Convention. Um, and, and people were amazed at how you, you managed to do it. Uh, and, and of course, there's a, there's a very a fun anecdote that, that's attached to part of that process of that whole discussion um, that involves like bad weather and stuff like that. Tell us more about that. Well, first I would say that um, I would not have been able to do this alone. It was very much a team-based uh, conclusion and effort and outcome with the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Um, and there are actually a lot of interesting stories <laughs> that have that pervaded the negotiations. And the one that you refer to is uh, something that's become a little bit uh, funnily enough, quite a famous snowstorm meeting uh, where, can I just say that meeting at the United Nations in February is a very dangerous time <laughs> because while I was living in New York uh, and even since, there's always some kind of Armageddon-like snowstorm that hits the city. Right, right. And in the year that we were negotiating the Singapore Convention, uh, it resulted in a shutdown of the United Nations headquarters mm -hmm. building. And so we could not go into the meeting, which is fine. I mean, I think everybody would have enjoyed the day off, myself included, you know, snuggle up, cozy, <laughs> um, with a warm drink and, and heating. But the problem was we were at that point in the negotiations where mm. our momentum was actually pretty good. Right, right. And that one day break, um, at least in my view at the time, and I didn't have the opportunity to confer with others because it was happening so quickly. It was like overnight notice, oh, it's going to be closed. Right. Let's keep in con contact with each other to see when are they closing transport systems? Mm -hmm. When are they closing the building? Are they going to reopen it? So it was a bit of like a live update situation. Uh, but my sense was if the meeting didn't happen for that extra day, we were going to lose, we were at the risk, a real risk of losing all that momentum and progress that we managed to achieve in the course of the week. So informal channels had to be opened. Um, a delegate from uh, the Canadian delegation said, actually, I have connections with a particular law firm. They're willing to open their office mm -hmm. to us to have a meeting in their building. Okay. Uh, and he managed to gain access to the office uh, with authority, with authorization, for us to have our meeting there. Then it came, became an issue of how do we make sure that this is not a closed door, clandestine meeting where any progress that emerges from it will be rejected in That's the right. room. Yeah. Uh, so the word had to be sent out and said, 
you know, this is going to be an open meeting. Anybody who's interested has to attend. But, right, right. But we had no way of communicating really with everyone okay. in a reliable way. So there, again, there was all this informal um, channels of communication to get people into the room. There were certain delegations that you knew. There were certain countries and representatives that you knew. These people absolutely had to be in the room. Sure. If they were not there, no go. Right, right. In addition, anybody else who wanted to be there should be allowed to attend. Okay. So over time, we started early. We started in the morning. Um, and how big is this group we're talking about? Like, how many people are involved in this So it grew. It grew in the course of the morning. I think we started of maybe 10 to 15. Okay. Um, so it wasn't clandestine. I mean, as in, as in the attempt to not be clandestine. <laughs> not be clandestine. Um, and I think we achieved not being clandestine. But so it was a, a 10, I think we started with 10 to 15. But in the course of the morning, um, we were, you know, already on our mobile phone saying, can you come? Get out of bed. Come on. <laughs> trudge through the snow and get here. Something important is happening. I actually said that to, to someone. I said, get out <laughs> and come. Um, you don't want to miss this. Uh, so so people came. I think eventually we ended up 20, 30 people, which mm. was pretty good on a snowy, dangerous to go out kind of day. Okay. Um, and the, the, the five package the five issue package deal that was core to securing the way we could move forward on the Singapore Convention had its details nutted out in the context of this meeting. Mm. Um, the United States, European Union, Israel, um, uh, the member states of the European Union. We also tried to get uh, other delegations involved from, from Asia, Latin America, to make mm. sure that they could be in the room as well. So to the extent that we could draw people into the room, they came. The people who were willing to attend, they came. And then at one point, um, it was way into lunch. Mm. Uh, but again, I kept thinking, oh, but if we leave, right. we, we haven't really gotten to the point where right. we can deliver something into the meeting tomorrow. So I said, everybody stay here. Nobody leave. <laughs> I'm going out to get sandwiches. <laughs> so I walked out in the snow um, and was the delivery girl uh, brought back bags of lunch for right. everyone and said, okay, we sit here. We're all being fed and watered. We sit until we're done. Um, and we emerged from that meeting with, the deta with finer details on that package deal, Amazing. which could then be presented by delegations in the room as a delegation, as a set of delegations right. who are proposing it, right. which could then be formally discussed if needed and ado Adop eventually adopted. adopted. Yeah. It was eventually uh, adopted right. in the room. So. so the sandwich in the snowstorm. Yes. That, that is, that's the trick <laughs> that you have to adopt if you want to get consensus. You always keep people food fed and watered so they're not hangry <laughs> and they're not, you know, tipping over from right. exhaustion and dehydration. No, happy I, people make happy negotiate. But I, I love how the fact that because you're the chair and you volunteered to go out into the snowstorm, you know, when everyone's snugly inside the room to bring back sandwiches, I, I personally feel like that must have had some impact on the rest of them to say, okay, you know, if Natalie's going to make such a sacrifice, I think all of us, you know, should, should honour that and, and put in the effort as well. I mean... You could have easily tasked someone to go and buy the sandwiches, but you went yourself. I thought that was a very powerful message that was sent. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I hadn't thought of it that way. Actually, I just wanted because to make sure... Chair. I just didn't want anybody to leave the room. Right. So my interests were actually very um, uh, single-minded. No, but, but it's but the yeah. selflessness of it, I think, that probably made an impact on some of the people who could have been a little bit more difficult, you know, a bit intransigent, maybe a bit... Um, you know, like, hey, okay, are we done? Can we leave? Um, but like, oh, wow, she walked out in the snow and brought back sandwiches for us. I, I think that that, to me, probably helped tip things a little bit in your favor when they say, okay, uh, what else do you need us to do today before we leave and so on? Which, which, I, I hope so. I mean, I hope so. No, because you never know, the yeah. reason why I bring this up is because when we were, um, you know, having this podcast with George and he was talking about uh, this huge billion dollar mediation that he successfully you know conducted um, between Korean parties and Americans this was in public record so he could talk about it um, he started off by bringing mooncakes and and tea which completely changed the dynamic who people were coming in with that mindset to fight and then they were totally thrown off by him saying no no let's just eat and talk and just get to know each other a little before we even start talking about the issues um, that was a very powerful example of how an individual, affected the dynamic of the room, which then affected, you know, the outcome possibly, but well, I mean, the result speaks for itself. And likewise for you, the result speaks for itself. You came out with something which you could use the next day. Um, so so I, I feel personally that that 
is another example of how an individual uh, did things that might, might not have been expected and, and it sort of created an impression in everyone's minds to say, oh, okay, um, you know, maybe, maybe let's, let's just put in a bit more and, and see what we can get out of this, you know. I think I think that's probably. I mean that that makes sense to me as well. Mm. Um, and the, the the one thing that I really enjoyed about our negotiations uh, in that context of that group of representatives and people, uh, and for the Singapore Convention was at the at the base level there was a connection of friendship that had been built through the process, through the many conversations that we were having, through trying to figure out a project together. When I went to get the sandwich, um, somebody walked out with me, you know, this volunteer to say, oh, let me come out in the snow with you, don't go alone, right, right. Uh, which spoke to me as, you know, great, thanks, don't just say, out <laughs> she goes, <laughs> got rid of her now, let's lock the door behind. And, uh, but, but, you know, so there was there was that element of caring for each other mm -hmm. at a personal level mm -hmm. that I do think fed into um, a negotiation dynamic that was more constructive, right. as opposed to raising hell and fury yep. and drama, which can also happen. I've seen it happen in negotiations as well. Raised voices, emotional, um, digging your heels in just for the sake of. Uh, but the 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 one thing that I did appreciate about this particular group was over time we managed to, you know, have that climate of friendship that ensconced us mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, wrapped us so that even in the most difficult of discussions, at the end of the day, it would just be okay. Let's take a breather. Let's come back when we're feeling a little bit better. Uh, so that we can, you know, get at this with fresh minds and right. not not cross into personal attacks or or anything like that. It's right. very very professional, um, although fueled by that personal trust and friendship. So quite apart from the the individual's um, demeanor and negotiating style in the room, um, do you also have to take into account the country they represent? I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't sound nice. Because it sounds like some countries um, have a bit more heft than others, even though they may have the same number of votes in the international arena. But but let's be let's be real. I mean, certain countries you tend to take the the voices more seriously than others simply because there's so much um, power backing that that delegation, whether it's political power, military power, economic heft, all of these things, does that play a little bit into the way you deal with these individuals? So in a multilateral setting, I think that temptation for anyone who's chairing a meeting will always be there. Uh, but it becomes even more important because of that temptation to not give in to it. Right. Uh, the, the multilateral system works well because everybody who's participating in the system is there on an equal footing. Right. And if you start regarding one delegation as more powerful than another for, for reasons that are outside um, of, of the room, important, important, I, I recognize it, it's geopolitical realities. Right. Uh, but if, if you let it play into things like how you're going to run a procedure, so for example, um, I will call on a, on a procedure question differently just because you're from a larger country and then I call against you uh, because you're a smaller country. Right. That is exactly exactly the kind of move that will undermine the legitimacy and, and trust mm -hmm. in a chairperson and you lose your, your cachet mm -hmm. to be able to then draw people together when it does become a difficult issue and you I need see. the kind of buy-in. Um, so for me personally, it, 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 I've, I've always um, told myself you've got to be effectively operating behind a blind veil. Um, you can't think about what delegation this is. Right. It's about the principal approach mm -hmm. to the substantive issues and to the procedural issues. But but here's the interesting thing. See, when you when you mention it and you frame it like that, the principled approach. Uh, now I get the idea that uh, you know you don't want to silence voices just because they come from a smaller nation. You know, like an island nation like ours, for example, versus a huge country. You know that has got you know people um, spanning many time zones. Um, but there's an argument that can be made about the fact that you really represent this tiny slice of people on this planet, whereas my country, even though I get one vote, um, we, uh, we account for such a large number of people. And again, we, we are such a large part of the global economy and et cetera, et cetera. Shouldn't our one vote 
be a little bit different from your one vote because your island has so few people on it. What what do you say to something like that? Because that that kind of does does have a little bit of um you know sort of logic to it. Like which which in fact sort of is represented in a very interesting way in the US political system that I'm sure you're very familiar with, where if you look at Congress in terms of you know congressmen, you know, representatives, those vary by state because of population. So the smaller states have less representatives in Congress. Um, bigger states like California, they have a lot more because of their population size. But every state gets only two senators. So you can be California, you can be huge, but you get two senators. And you can be Rhode Island and you can be tiny and you get two senators. So that's a very interesting kind of thing where your size doesn't matter in one context and your size does in another. But in the UN, it's you know, it's not like that. You don't, you don't get to send more people because you're a big country. So, so do you find sometimes delegations that come from places like that feel a little bit like, like my vote still ought to weigh more than yours? I mean, That perception does exist. I mean, I have uh, encountered persons who say, you know, you, 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 need to, you need to fall in line because this is my country's position and mm-hmm. you know how important my country is. Right. Uh, but pressures of that na- are not limited to that kind of pressure. Okay. And the pressures... Um, on a, on a particular representative in your country, of, of your if you are representing your country or even as chairperson, will abound. Um, and if you give in to one type of pressure, you're more liable to have to cave into all sorts of other types of pressures, and you end up being be, being pulled in a multitude of directions that then becomes very unsustainable and unfeasible uh, to be able to run a legitimate process. Um, so, so that happens. And I would say it falls to each delegation, even if they're from a larger country, to still advocate mm-hmm. for themselves, um, to still uh, highlight it's about the importance of the issue to a delegation. So a small country can face an existential issue. Right. Why should that be viewed in any less terms than uh, an, an issue for a larger country sure. because if you if you reframe the type of concerns that they're advocating rising for, sea levels for rising example sea levels, right. exactly okay. exactly and, and and power in a multilateral uh, negotiation setting can also be constructed if I, if I'm, I'm not sure that's the best word but it can also be constructed blocks. in that you can have blocks alliances have and blocks and alliances that's right and there's some ways in which countries and, and representatives find ways to to counter the geopolitical element or Fair just enough. to be a little bit more convincing in their advocacy to show the weight of opinion uh, so it may be for different reasons and purposes but those are some ways in which you can recalibrate as a delegation mm-hmm. uh, balance in the room because not all processes, um, sometimes you will end up in a process where it's true. Some some delegates or some countries are given a little bit more uh, sway than others. Mm-hmm. may not always coincide with being a large country. It could be for another reason. It could be a rich country. Right, it could be right. the current chair of something or other, a powerful position in another process. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are different sources of power that right. can play in. Interesting. And so it's always important for a delegation to know um, how, to, how do you organize yourself? How do you organize yourself with others um, to be able to balance things out a little bit more? On, on a personal level, uh, are there some tricks that you could reveal in your personal negotiating style uh, when dealing with, say, one party, you know, in a, say, in a bilateral kind of setting or in a multilateral setting, there's a couple of people who are a bit more um, difficult in terms of getting them to, to sort of sign on to something that you really need their, their votes or their help. Um, do you find some things have worked? For you personally, um, I well yes, <laughs> I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that uh, there there are certain things that you can do to make life a little bit easier for everyone. Right. Foremost amongst uh, the list, uh, top of the list, I would say is it's very important to be authentic. Okay. Um, it's very important for people to know that when you are approaching them or for an issue, when you're dis- engaging in a discussion, you are genuine about it. Okay. You are seeking to understand. You are upfront with perhaps even the weaknesses in your own position or your own lack of information. You're seeking clarity. Uh, you're actively listening to what they're telling you, mm-hmm. uh, taking on board. It's it's almost imp- it's almost as important, if not more important, to know how to listen than to know how to advocate. Uh, okay. Sometimes being quiet, holding back, um, just lending that ear 
achieves a lot more than talking. Right. And and that that is something that I feel that's worked. And at the end of the day, uh, I think consistency okay. uh, is critical because, okay. as you pointed out, in a multilateral context, it's a long game. The world is very small, and mm-hmm. the players are not as many. After a certain amount of time, you keep bumping into the same people. Okay, uh, and it's good for everybody to know that they know who they're dealing with. Okay, uh, and that really helps to to kind of smoothen things along, even when it gets difficult, even when somebody is a little bit more um, aggressive or abrasive. Right, I think these these three things: being able to uh, be authentic and actively listen and just be consistent in your own approach helps to calm the temperatures Mm -hmm. um, and put reason into the conversation where it may be absent. Well, well, I mean, I I would describe what you're saying as really trust, trying to build trust and rapport, both, you know, as an individual that people can can trust you for what you're doing and what you say, and also to build that rapport with a particular counterpart from another country. Um, but do you also find a tension between, on one hand, wanting to do all those things in order to build that trust and rapport, but yet being constrained by the fact that your country says you're not supposed to reveal all the cards because we don't want them to know that we have these weaknesses. I mean, have you faced situations where you kind of, I, I wish I could tell you this, but I can't. I'm explicitly told that I'm not supposed to let anyone know that this is one of our worries or concerns or problems. So I'm definitely not saying that in being genuine and open and upfront that you sell the house. Of course. Um, so the, the, what always comes first is national interest. Right. When you're representing your country, uh, the national interest and agenda will always come first. Uh, but with that guiding light, with that load star, with that north star, um, it, you can have these other elements come into play. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about telling somebody perhaps, look, this is my position. I can't give it. I can't give you anything more than this, um, but I still hope that we can work together. You know, we don't have to make this a difficult negotiation. Uh, but I'm being upfront with you that this is incredibly important to me. Uh, so let's try and work around this. I think. I think that kind of honesty mm. uh, is is what is what is often appreciated because you're not playing games. It's not brinkmanship. I'm not trying to hoodwink you and trying to get away with it. Um, There is a particular interest that I'm trying to safeguard. You know it's important to me. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to know what's important to you. Let's try and find a win-win. Um, and I think that kind of approach is is better than trying to play games. It it's very obvious in a multilateral circuit. If you can get away with it the first time, but never again. Right. Um, right. So trying people to, don't trust you after that. Exactly. Exactly. So you and it's easy to get called out. There's so many players. Right. Um, and and what are you going to do? Play one side against the other? That's disastrous. Uh, I wouldn't. I would never advise anybody, not even my enemy, to do to do something <laughs> like that. Um, it's 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 a suicide move. Um, so always be upfront and always be honest, straightforward, yeah, consistent. Have you had any like particularly um, difficult or even you know situations where you felt like, oh gosh, this this went downhill rapidly and and we didn't expect it to get so bad so quickly and then you had to do something to try to save the situation um, and whether it was saved or have you encountered that kind of yes um, so uh, there was there was one situation where um, we were trying to find out a way to to reflect where the negotiation had reached before we came back to it a few months later. Um, And it was about numbers. So one delegation would say zero, another one would say 10, and it was three, six, eight. We thought, well, we can't write all these numbers down. It's a bit meaningless, isn't it? Okay, let's use alphabets. No, we can't because what is it? How are you going to interrelate the numbers with each other? Is Does XXX mean 666 or 333? Um, does XYZ mean 642 um, or something? So that it was it was an incredible... Uh, people were seeing shadows and skeletons in everything. Right. Um, and I was watching this happen and it was a deadlock. We had solved everything else um, except how to reflect where we gotten. And if you couldn't reflect it, there was a danger that when you left it, you would have to come back and start from scratch again. again yeah. Um, so after a while, I I was looking at everybody get getting incredibly heated up. At one point, somebody stepped up and said, "This is this is it. We're we're never going to break this deadlock. Um, we're at the end of it." Uh, and and I said, "Well, how about if we put ellipsis? Dot dot dot. It's not alphabets. It's just a placeholder." Um, and 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 that 
that was able to gain support around the room. And everybody said, yes, let's do that. Ellipses are fantastic. Three dots. Who would have thought three dots? <laughs> Small little periods um, would have would have had that effect. But, wow. that, but that's what, it, I mean, there was part of, there are other details to the, to the, to the deal, um, but that was the core of it. Right. Um, there, there are a number of other examples that don't involve drafting, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, but and, and some of them involve actually at the end of the day, ele- escalating the issue. Okay. So I think one thing that's important in a governmental context, and I'm bringing myself back to your initial question, the difference with with uh, maybe commercial settings, is sometimes you do need to escalate to a political level mm-hmm. uh, in order to resolve an issue that's happening at effectively technical or expert level. Right, right. And um, we had one negotiation where... Uh, we were there till the wee hours of the morning, mm-hmm. and there were two delegations on opposite sides that were just entrenched, and they wanted diametrically opposite things mm-hmm. in terms. And there was no skillful drafting that would get around it. And at the end of the day, we had to wake people up, call, call right. back home, back to back to your home country, call your highest level um, representative who's who's in where we are, um, and uh, other members of the or- international organization that we were at sent their representatives into the into negotiation as mm-hmm. well to sort out a political compromise. Right. Um, right. Because they saw the issue uh, as impacting domestic politics and what was happening back home. Um, so knowing when to call for that Escalation, right, um, is also is also something that we've had to do. No, I suppose that's that's actually um, similar to commercial negotiation because you may have a certain mandate when you enter the room, and then you realize that actually we are this close, but it's just a bit outside of what I've been authorized to to give. I just need to call my principal back home, and if we can just push this over the line, I'm sorry to have to wake him up or wake her up at whatever time of the day, but we're this close, and let's not leave the room until we've, we've you know, sort of tied this up. So, so I think in that sense, you're doing the same thing. It's just it's a political context where you as a certain person of a certain level uh, can't go outside of this box, but you know that just a little bit more, if your political masters agree to it, Everything could have been just basically, you know, agreed to. So, so that's interesting. Well, we're running out of time. I want to end with a personal question. Um, so, so if if there was some seminal um, moment in history where some treaty or some diplomatic sort of um, uh, you know, event was taking place that that you feel has has some major significance in history. And if you could go back in time and be one of the persons who's instrumental and involved in it and then have a you know front row seat to what's going on, what would what an event in history like that be? So I am a bit of an international law geek, if it's not apparent by now. Um, and, but even in that mold, I struggle to pick one. So maybe I'll give you two. Sure, that's fine. Um, and one would be the Treaty of Westphalia, mm-hmm. which is the foundational um, treaty for the state-based approach to international law. Right. And the other would be uh, the founding of the League of Nations, because the UN has been so central to my interests and passions and, and professional life right. um, for, for all these years. I would love to see how all that came into being. Right. So, so for, for our listeners, uh, the League of Nations is actually the precursor to the United Nations. This is the pre-World uh, War II version of of the UN. Uh, and, and the Treaty of Westphalia was um, back when Europe was, was a whole bunch of little countries, not the ones we recognize today, like Germany or Italy, but actually little states. And Westphalia was actually one of the states, um, you know, in the southern part uh, of, of Europe. And uh, so so that's that's an interesting thing that if you could go back in time and be involved there, that would have been a dream come true for you. Yeah, one day with tech advancements, I hope to <laughs> actualize. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. Who knows, yeah. And we look in the history books and wait, that looks like yeah, yeah. Natalie at the table, Waving right? From yeah. my- <laughs> So, but thank you so much. This has been amazing, fantastic, lovely stuff. And, and we're glad that you um, peeled back a few layers for us to see how negotiation uh, at government and international level uh, looks like compared to what most of our listeners will be familiar with, which is the commercial type. So thank you so much again, Natalie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure was mine. All right. Take care.